Hey, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. Week eight of A Better Way Forward. My name is Dusty Otis. I'm the pastor here. If you're joining me on DustyOtis.com or on Redefined or from The Grove, I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for taking part of your day to join me online. This message is for you. This is a way that we get to grow together. And so um, the good thing about this is you get it first. And so this is the first of, of really three takes for me and then twice getting to listen to it. And so I'm super thankful that you're here and honored to share with you. And so you really get the whole thing. You get the meat of all of it. And, uh, and you teach me a lot through this process, too. So I'm grateful you're here. Thanks for taking part of your day to be with me. Uh, the goal and the focus of A Better Way Forward is the journey that we started eight weeks ago to get to a better place by the first of the year so we can attack our New Year so we can approach New Year healthy, balanced, rooted, so we can grow and live our next year on purpose. The foundation of this series is rooted in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where this is the Apostle Paul. He's encouraging us to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. And he says, Now may the God of peace sanctify you through and through, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, from the inside all the way out, right? May your spirit, soul, and body be kept and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. We're talking about your heart, mind, and flesh, your be, who you are, your be identity, your do identity, and then your actual self, which is your soul. And so last week we talked about, uh, we went actually in depth about your soul and strengthening your soul. If you missed that message, make sure you go back. So there's this cra crazy study that's going on, uh, and it, it says and shows that the majority of Americans prefer employment over enjoyment. We would much rather work and be busy than to rest and have relaxation. We become workaholics is what, we've ha is what has happened, right? And... One, to get more, but two, because a lot of people don't know how to stop. And so, yeah, we, we work and we like to work, but really, uh, one, we put ourselves in places that we have to work, right? And the other one is we don't know how to stop. And so most people are comfortable, uh, m more comfortable doing than they are not doing. They're uncomfortable without something to do. And so then the same study shows that America is actually sleep deprived, that we're getting two hours less of sleep a night now than we did 50 years ago. And most of that's due to technology, but, a lot of, but the other half of it is also that we like to work. We don't know how to rest. We can't relax, especially when someone tells us to relax, right? Just relax. Everybody, anybody ever tell you that? I'm sure that fires you right up, right? And in all of that, uh, what we see is this is just like Job. Job uh, chapter 20, verse 18 says, they're unable to relax and enjoy anything that they work for, anything that they work for. And so then how are we supposed to rest? Well, let's, let's, let's go step up. What are we talking about today? We're talking about finding your flow. What is a healthy rhythm of life for you? How do you find your flow? And it really begins with how do you rest? Because if you're not rested going into it, I tell you, years ago, me and Heather bought a, a mattress that was expensive. It's the most expensive thing we've purchased uh, in our marriage, actually. And uh, that mattress is amazing. And we did that because we know the quality of sleep determines the quality of our days right? And so these sleep studies and knowing that we're workaholics and, and knowing that we need rest, how are we to rest? And in Genesis 2-2, you have the story of creation. And this is uh, the first chapter. God talks about the first six days of creation and everything that he created. He said all of it was good. And then on day seven, it says, by the seventh day, God had finished all the work. He had just finished completing man building, starting, creating humanity, all the work he'd been doing. And on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating all that he had done, right? From all the work of creating that he had done. And so God said it was good and he took a day to enjoy what he'd done. He took a day to enjoy the work that he made. And so this is the example. God rested intentionally and he calls us, God calls us to be imitators of him and everything that we do. And really, God set the rhythm of your life when time began. He set the rhythm for us, right? This is the flow that we're supposed to live in. And so now, now this, God knows what you need, right? He knows how you need it. The reality is God is the author and the perfecter of your faith, but he's also the author of the book that we call the Bible, that we lean into, that we read, that we find the basic principles of how we're to live our life. And because he's the author of your life and the author of the book, you should probably be in tune with him. And the only way we can do that is to stop and to rest. This allows, when we stop and rest, this allows the busyness to quiet down so we can actually hear God speak to us. Otherwise, not doing that, we're refusing to, set, to accept the rhythm that God created us to live in. As image bearers, part of our 
ability to become like Jesus and reflect his image is to rest, is to rest like he did. And when we come to a halt, we connect with our spirit, with the image that we're made in, in our mind, our will, and our emotions, our soulish part of us, as well as our physical body, because of that spiritual connection, right? And our physical body become wired by God for the rhythm of work, play, rest, and recreation that he created us for. And what I want you to see today is intentional rest gives us spiritual connection. Unintentional rest gives us restlessness. And because of restlessness, there's now pills for that, right? And so we get restless because we're out of rhythm and we're disconnected spiritually. We get restless because we're out of rhythm and disconnected spiritually. By the way, this is not a message on you need to sleep more, okay? Which we could all use, right? It's a message on intentionally stopping work to rest, which requires us to be and engage uh, toward the three parts of our being, spirit, soul, body. It takes discipline in those three areas. And so what you see in Exodus 31, 17 really backs up what God did on day seven. It says, one day a week will always serve as a reminder that I made the heavens and the earth in six days. And then on the seventh, I rested and I relaxed. Now God modeled this for us. And then he said, you should do this. Do what? You should work six and rest one, rest the seventh. God said he made us in his image. We're called to, be more, we're called to become more like God. God's goal for you is Christ-like character, to be like his son. You develop character through living God's rhythm in your life, not by doing more. Okay? And what we see is the rest, rest for us in the fourth commandment. This is the second time we see it. And this is when God gives it to Moses uh, for the people. And the fourth commandment is also the longest commandment of the ten. And the fourth commandment to tells, tells us to take a Sabbath day's rest. A Sabbath day's rest. Now, Sabbath is one of those churchy words that, that sometimes we can get lost in and confused with. And Sabbath is really a Hebrew word that means to cease, to stop working, or to rest. And so this is what God did on the seventh day. Now he's telling his people who were enslaved for over 400 years, hey, you need to take a day off. Okay, trust me, take a day off. And so Sabbath in biblical terms is really, in, in context, is to stop and do nothing for 24 hours. God's asking you to rest. He's requiring you to rest for your benefit. And he's commanding you to do that. That commandment is so we'll take it seriously. Everyone should rest. Rest is not a bad word, by the way. And so today, in today's message, if I say, if I say stop, if I say rest, I'm really saying Sabbath, okay? And what you need to know is the discipline of rest at its root is stopping, is stopping to trust God. We imitate God by stopping our work to rest. After the six days that we work, whatever that rhythm is, we take one to rest. And what keeps us from doing that is lack of trust in God's rhythm for us. We don't believe that God can, can make up for that one day that we take off, right? We don't stop to rest because he said so. That's not the reason. We stop to rest because we trust him. Well, God said you should rest. Well, that's, that's most of the reason that most boneheaded dudes are not resting. Don't tell me what to do, right? We don't stop to rest because he said so. We stop to rest because we trust him. So to find your flow, the first thing you do is receive the invitation from God to stop and rest, which means you need to trust him in your stopping. You need to trust God in your stopping. I'm going to share a few uh, moments of my mistrust with God in my life where I felt I was responsible, where I was the one, where uh, I had to work, work, work because of everything depended on me and, and, and I had to pay my bills and, and we had kids and, and all that. There was a time in my ministry career, I was working at one place. At that one place, I was holding three full-time jobs within the same organization. I was getting one paycheck and they were really getting their money's worth. And I loved every second of it. There's nothing wrong with, with, what I'm, with what I'm saying. I was crunched for time regularly. I love the fact that I was doing the job of three people. I took pride in that. It meant a lot to me. And one day I was in between two positions. I was working on the third. And I got to a place where um, I remember walking down the hall and I started shaking profusely, sweating profusely, like I couldn't control. I started sweating big old fat sweat drops. I got the shakes, I got really lightheaded and I got super dizzy and I made it right, I made it into a closet, a closet and I fell onto what was a, some type of rack, 
a ball rack or something. I don't even remember what it was. It was, it was inside of a gymnasium. I fell over. I was all by myself. And the first thing I did was look at my clock to see how much time I had here before I had to be at the next place. So silly. And, and as I looked at that, I realized I only have seven minutes to get over to a place 10 minutes away, so I'm already late. I haven't even done what I came here to do, and so I'm not going to make it. And, and I don't like to be late, so I, so I was late, which is, which is bad. That's bad juju for me. I was like, man, I feel like such a failure when I'm late. I do. And I felt guilty. I was embarrassed, and I felt that I dropped the ball. And after I got through all that, while feeling like I felt, I didn't know if I was going to make it out of that closet. My heart was racing. My blood pressure was through the roof. I'm sweating. I don't have any faculties about me. I'm, I'm in fear of my life right now. And so I scrambled to find some food. I, I, I come out of the closet and I just kind of lean on the wall. I walk down the wall and I actually stole two bags of Cheetos that I never paid for. So I owe that place <laughs> probably a buck, right? Two bags of Cheetos, a bottle of water. I focused on controlling my breathing. I called somebody to take my spot to fill in for me, said I'd be right there, I'm just running a few minutes late. Didn't tell anybody about anything, okay? Folks, I ended up getting myself together and being, and being just about 15 minutes late over to the next place, and when I roll in, nothing's happened, man. I got myself composed, I'm back together, hit the ground like nothing ever happened, never missed a beat, right? Sadly, I had a few times like that in ministry. I've had times like that in the past. There have been uh, several times, several times, three to be exact, where I've had massive, extensive, in-depth surgeries, all requiring me to be off of work for at least three days, and then two were seven days. But I was back at work the next morning at 5 a.m. after all three of those surgeries, because I could, because I was devoted, because I was loyal, because I loved it, because, because I was ignorant, really. I've led church services where I've stepped off stage and changed bandages on my stomach so, so blood wouldn't come through my shirt as I taught. All while Heather is standing over the side, shaking her head in disbelief at me. What are you doing? What are you doing? All because I had, it was on me, right? And I want to tell you that none of those moments are trophies for me. They were at that time. I'm durable. I can last right? I thought they were then, but a couple of times, two in particular, they almost took my life. They almost took my life because I was ignorant. Because like most of America, I was addicted to adrenaline, right? And I love to accomplish, just a race to accomplish. How much can I get done today, right? Who's going to know all that I did today? It's going to be amazing, right? And what I'm sharing with you today is very real. It's super real. And finding your flow is not just going to save your life. It's going to extend it. It's going to extend it. And so stopping or rest is a lesson that I had to learn over and over and over. It's something I'm well aware of now because I know that I can get into the ditch of doing very easily. And if I fall into that, it's dangerous for me. It's dangerous. And so rest is really the root of why I teach. It's why I do what I do. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be completely healthy because I've been unhealthy. And when I teach and share these things, I'm teaching to me first. So, and, and, and if I don't think it's going to hit me, if I don't believe God's speaking to me through this, I won't share it with you. There's so much preparation that goes into this, and so that's why I'm so thankful you're here. Or you give me purpose. And so I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands, but I do want to take a quiz real quick. Let's see how busy you are. See if you might be, if you might be a redneck. No, if you might be a workaholic, right? One, are you always in a hurry? Are you always in a hurry? Just, man, always got to go. Is your to-do list unrealistically long? Is it like that intentionally? Is it like that unintentionally, but you just feel the pressure of that list? Do you use off days as on days to catch up on unfinished work that you didn't get done this past week? Number four, has more than one person ever advised you, hey, you should slow down? Do you feel guilty if you leave work early. Boy, that was huge for me. By the way, all of, my, all of these questions I would answer yes to at one point in time in my life. Do you feel guilty when you relax? Do you feel guilty when you put your feet up and relax? Do you have to get sick? Does crisis have to happen 
for you to get time off. That was huge. One time I got forced to go on vacation and I realized that the place was going to make it without me. It was the best thing for me, but it was the hardest thing for me to do. Do you have to get sick to take time off? Do you only get Christmas cards from people you work with? Do you only get Christmas cards from people you do business with? Is your phone always on? Is it always in reach? Do you take work to the bathroom with you? <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. Does your family think you live there or that you just occupy space for a few hours a day? Today you might be in the same spot that I was and you might say, but Dusty, I have to do all those. I have to do all those. And the reality is, is you don't because all the stuff that you're doing and all of that will be there even if you're not. Even if you're not. And I just want to challenge you to look around Look around where you are and ask yourself, when you see the people that walk down the streets where you live, that live in the community, the city you live, do they feel the same way you do? Do they think the same way you do? That I, I really, I really have to, right? Where I live, there are a ton of people who are content to walk the streets every day. And, and they know at night there's going to be a place for them to sleep. They don't know where it is during the day, but they know at night. They know they're going to find food that day. And, and, I, and I, again, I know that, that some people, that everybody doesn't have the same expectation, the same values, all those things. But a lot of stuff that we do that limits us from rest, we do to ourselves, right? And so, so do you really have to? What's the Bible say about it? I'm glad you asked. It's Matthew 6, 26 through 34. And I'm going to paraphrase this. It's, it's super long, but it's what it says. Look at the beards of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, and they don't gather, but God takes care of them. And it says, are you worried about clothes? Look at the lilies and the wildflowers of the field. They grow. They don't work either. The birds, the flowers, they don't do any work. Yet God provides and takes care of them, right? And if he does, how much more will he take care of you? How much more will he take care of you? Therefore, do not worry. Therefore, don't have such little faith. Don't worry, be anxious, perpetually uneasy, distracted, saying, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For your heavenly Father, God, your Creator, knows exactly what you need. Matthew 6, one of my all-time favorite verses. But first, and most importantly, seek Him. Seek Him first. Not you first, seek Him first. And go after His kingdom and His righteousness, His way of doing and being right. The attitude and character of God. And all these things will be given to you. What's he saying? What is seeking first him and his righteousness and his way, six on, one off. So then, if you do that, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, we'll worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ever wondered why you go so hard, even if God has your back anyway? I didn't. I didn't. Because I didn't believe that. I believed that I had, that I, it was on me, right? I have to, I rely on me. I have to provide. I have to be the one carrying it, right? And the reality is stepping, stepping into rest or stopping to rest is the only way that we get to take a longer look and a deeper look at our lives. Because truth is, we can work without stopping and we can go faster and faster and we can go more and more. But there's nothing that roams the earth that lives and, and goes at the pace that we go. I don't see lions on their cell phone, Right? I don't see chimpanzees on their cell phone. I don't see birds with cell phones. I don't see sharks with cell phones. I don't see anything else on the face of the earth that works and lives at the, at the pace that we do. Nothing works like us. And the reality is we are part of creation. We are not the creator, right? Which means we're subject to creation seasons, laws, and rhythms. And God's rhythm for us is six on, one off. Six on, one off. And so question for you today, when you reflect on that, when you reflect on the fact of the scripture I just read in Matthew chapter 6, when you realize that nothing lives like us, and you think about the rhythms of nature, and the birds of the air, and the flowers that grow, and, and the people who roam your streets, do you desire a different rhythm for your life? Or are you just trying to be like somebody else? Mark 2.27 says, Rest was made for man, not man for rest. 
which means rest is always there waiting on you. And really, rest is really dependent on your readiness to stop. Rest is there the whole time. That means we don't stop when we finish a project or a call or respond to an email or get through all of our notifications on our phone or get through the stack of paperwork that's waiting for us that's due tomorrow. Stopping doesn't mean to do a bunch of religious activity, to check a box, to say you did, to say, look at me, look at me, right? We stop because our spirit, our soul, and our body say, hey, it's time to stop. It's time to stop. Sadly, in these moments, we just grab a cup of coffee or some caffeine or whatever. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will, be cap- you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So then you don't have to worry. You only have to rest and trust God in your rest. He made it this way for a reason. So the truth is, if we only stop when our work is finished, if we only ever stop when our work is finished, I had to learn this the hard way, we're never going to stop because the work is never finished. It's never really completely done because once we get done, new responsibility comes. With every accomplishment comes new responsibility. And if we refuse to rest until we're finished, we won't rest until we make the transition from earth to heaven. And that's an easier way of saying we won't rest until we die. And the discipline of rest really liberates us from the need to be finished. And that's hard for some people to swallow. God invites you and he commands you to rest and relax, to enjoy where you are, to enjoy what you have, and to enjoy the very teeny tiny small part that you play in the world, that I play in the world, right? In that, rest means turn off completely, be disconnected from the world, be disconnected from the world. We don't stop because God said so, we stop because we trust him. We don't stop because he said so, we stop because we trust him. You know, a business that's figured out the Sabbath, Christian chicken, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is open six days a week, and on the seventh they are off, and they still sell more chicken (laughs) than restaurants that are open seven days a week, and they're the friendliest, double bonus. I got a friend who's in retail, and and he's open seven days a week, and he came to me, he's like, man, we're struggling. I don't know how, how much longer I'll be able to make payroll. All of these things, his business was falling apart, and I said, bro, everybody's exhausted. You, you know, you got this number of people and, and, and it's a struggle. Why don't you take a Sabbath? I can't take Sundays off, man. Sunday's the biggest day for, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm not asking you to take Sunday off. What's the, what's the slowest day? What's the slowest day? He's like, Monday's the slowest day. Like Monday's terrible. I said, dude, close on Mondays. Close on Mondays. Let everybody go home. Tell them, tell them on Sunday at six o'clock when you close. Hey man. You're off tomorrow. I want you to enjoy it. The first time he said that, it was like giving somebody a snow day. Snow day! Didn't know what was happening, but once it did, woo, no responsibility. Sabbath. That's a Sabbath. Now guess where his business is today. He makes seven times what he was making then, working only six days a week. Working only six days a week. So I want to ask you, what if you were intentional like that? What if you were intentional to stop and rest one day a week? What if you just stopped and rested one day a week? You took the biblical Sabbath, what God is asking us to do, to find the rhythm of your life, to connect with God, to reflect and think about where you are, what you have to enjoy, to enjoy. Well, I can't enjoy it, Dusty, because I live here and we got this and I got hot water heater. and I got... Shh. What if you just stopped and rested? and enjoyed where you are because somebody else has a little bit worse than you do, right? Why? Why do we want to stop and rest? Because without time to stop, we struggle. We struggle to notice God's hand in our lives. We fight reflecting on what we're thankful for. We refuse to step outside of culture's demands, and we refuse to search our heart or seek God's direction for our life. Why? Because we got to go. I always joke around, people, people even here have noticed, I'll say, We have STD. We have stuff to do. 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 And it's a joke here. That that wasn't a joke in my life at one point. It was like, 
Let's go. Let's go. We got, the other one was, was GSD. We're going to get stuff done. We're going to get stuff done. Right? That's what we do. We get stuff done. That's what Dusty does. He gets stuff done. Man, that was exhausting. That was so exhausting. Why? I, I wasn't happy with where I was. You know why? I never took time to rest and say, thank you, God, for everything you've given me. Man, my family's great. We have a roof over our head. I got money in the bank. I've got food on our table. I've got awesome kids. Let's do this every day now. I've been doing this every day for almost 10 years. It will be 10 years this year. Stop. When we don't stop, we struggle to notice God's hand in our life. We can't see it. Regularly stopping, pausing, resting, and reflecting provides a rhythm, a rhythm powerful enough to anchor us in any storm. That sounds pretty good, Dusty. What do you mean? That anchor is so, instead of exhausting ourselves and running from the storm, we can actually have the faith and the confidence and the patience to settle down and let the storm pass. Trusting God through the storm. Why? Because we know what rest is. We know why it's so important. It provides a powerful rhythm that will anchor us in any storm. Rest does, not busyness. The Bible says the Lord is our shepherd. Psalms 23. I'm going to wrap this things up with, with Psalms 23. Psalm 23 highlights 10 things that a good shepherd does. I'm only going to talk about one. One thing that a good shepherd does is he leads his sheep to rest. He knows we can, we can go this long until we need water, food, and rest. Psalms 23, verses 1 through 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read all of these, and then we'll break them down. The Lord is my shepherd to feed, to guide, and to shield me. I shall not want. What's that? Lord, I have everything I need. I want a lot more. I want a boat. You can buy me a boat. You can buy me a truck to pull it, right? I want all this. Well, verse 1 is saying, I have everything I need. I have everything I need. Verse 2, he makes me. Makes is a big word there. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Lie down equals rest. When you lie down, you rest. When you're beside still water, you find refreshment. The Lord leads you to rest and refreshment. Two ways God can make you lay down. He makes me lay down. Snow day, sick day. Snow day, sick day. The choice is really yours. It's going to happen, right? The harder you run, the more susceptible you are to sickness. Rest allows you to regenerate, refresh. The rest period is twice as important as the work period. It's when you grow. It's when your body puts itself back together. Rest is everything. Number three, he refreshes and restores what we just talked about. He refreshes and restores my soul, which is my mind. My mind. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse three is the result of verse two. It's the result of letting God lead me. What do I get? What do I get for letting God lead me? Rest, refreshment, and restoration for my soul. Man, that sounds amazing. I don't know anybody, if I offered that right now and put a price on it, I would say, hey, I'm selling this right now. I'm selling rest, refreshment, and restoration, okay? $4.99, but today you can have it for free. Nobody would decline that, right? So to become more like Jesus, better character, become his image, it's going to take your best. It's going to take your best. It's going to take your best. When you follow Jesus, there's a commitment to, to living like him, to being salt and light. So that doesn't mean you need to do more. Nobody ever told you to do more to become like Jesus. It means you need to rest more. You need to rest more so that, so that you can be at your best. To give God your best requires rest. No rest equals stress. Rest equals blessed. What's the definition of blessed today? Rest, refreshed, restored. Blessed. Blessed. Benjamin Franklin said the greatest wealth is health, right? And so then the difference between blessed and stressed is rest. Is rest. It's not accomplishment. Accomplishment is when you do something, you put God's name on it, you do it for your benefit, and then you say, look at what the Lord has done. Hey, everybody, look what the Lord has done over here. I did all this, but man, praise God, right? It's not it. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He makes me lie down. Isn't it amazing how your perspective can change after a day off or a good night's rest? Heather sometimes looks at me like I have multiple personalities because I can, I can one day be like so fired up and be like, golly, if we could just get, if this would, I don't, 
Yeah, ah, ah, right? Go to sleep with him, like, ah. She's like, what? Like, hey, what? <laughs> what? You ever see a, to uh, a toddler or a child resisting rest? Back seat. We have five kids, so I get to witness this still today. Hey. Fighting it. F just fighting sleep. And you're back there going, you're, you're driving. You're in the passenger. You're going, for Pete's sake, just rest. Just relax. Just go to sleep. Just go to sleep. Just take a rest. Take a break. Go to sleep. We have hundreds of memories like these with our kids. The reality in that, child or adult, those who resist rest are immature. Resistance to rest is immaturity. It's not a trophy. It's immaturity. That's just the, that's the root of what it is. If we're going to become more like Christ, we're going to have to learn how to rest and relearn what it means to relax. So I want to identify what keeps us from that. What's the source of our stress? Why do we overwork? Why don't we get enough rest? The Bible's so full of, of reasons why we carry the load, why we look to ourselves. I want to look at, at five reasons. These are going to be bullet points. And I want to see if you can relate to any of these. The number one reason that people will not rest is misplaced identity. We base our worth in our work, right? Easy to confuse our worth in our work. Easy to, to uh, identify ourselves with what we do. Easy to confuse our net worth with our self-worth, our value with our valuables, right? And think, if I work harder, I'll be more successful and I'll be more valuable. That's, that's false. Until you realize that you're replaceable, and you're like, whoa, I don't have zero value at all. I just got laid off yesterday. I guess I bring nothing to the table here, right? These, the, these aren't people who think this. They think, they don't think they're not good enough. They think, if I don't work, if I'm not productive, I'm of no good, I'm no service, so I'm not valuable. And that's a lie. And so is believing that a title, a position, or a salary brings you worth. It does not. Here's Ecclesiastes 10, 15. The labor of a fool wears him out so much because he is ignorant that he can't even find his way home. It's a pretty bold statement, but it is truth. Life is more than work. Yes, work matters, but your life, your life is more important than your work. When you've misplaced identity, what happens is you put all of your time and your effort and your energy into your work and it becomes who you are. Yet what you do is not who God created you to be. Without rest, you don't realize it and you don't know any better. Misplaced identity. Number two reason is materialism. Materialism. This is always wanting more things. Always wanting more things. Well, when I got to have more, I got to make more. When I got to make more, I got to work more. When I work more, that's harder because I'm more tired. And so it takes more energy from me. So it takes longer hours to get more money so I can have more stuff. And it's this vicious cycle. Materialism is a trap. It's a trap because it's never enough. P. Diddy once said, more money, more problems, right? The more you make, the more you spend. Proverbs 23 verse 4 and 5 warns us about materialism. It says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Have the wisdom to show some restraint. Your money can be gone in a flash as if it grew wings and flew away like an eagle. This is probably why the founding fathers of our country put an eagle on every dollar bill to remind you how fast it can fly away, right? And what you need to know is materialism. This is, this is a brutal, tough point. Materialism leads us to spend the first half of our life sacrificing our health, overworking in order to gain wealth which leads us to spending the second half of our life sacrificing the wealth that we gained to bring our health back to where it was. Materialism. Luke 12, 14 warns us about this. It says, watch out. Always be on guard against every kind of greed because your life is not defined by how much you make or how many things you have. Materialism, like misplaced identity, will cause you to sacrifice rest. Number three. The number three reason we won't rest, envy, envy, wanting to be like other people. Well, you see that guy, you see what he's driving, you see where he lives, you see what he makes, see how he dresses, see what, do you look at her nails, her feet, her Gucci, Prada, right? Envy. Keeping up with the Joneses. We're keeping up with the Joneses, right? Keeping up with the neighbors, everyone else who we compare ourselves to. Do you see them? Do you know what they do? Oh, their kids do that? Our kids are doing that. Oh, their kids are in 17 sports? Our kids are going to be in 18 sports, right? And we try to keep up with people, which causes us to do things and have things 
that we don't have the time or capacity to do, right? Well, they're always on social media. Every time I'm on social media, they're on social media, so I'm going to be on social media. I want to see what they're doing because they're doing. Stop. Other people steal your time because of envy, because of your envy. Solomon, one of the smartest, the smartest man to ever live, Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 4.4 4 says, I've learned why people work so hard to succeed. It's because they envy the things their neighbors have, keeping up with the Joneses. Number four reason people will not rest. They have confused values. They have confused values. You value work above everything else. Work, everything else, right? Men tend to do this a lot easier and a lot more than women, but everybody is prone to do this. People have walked away from marriages. They've walked away from their family. They've walked away from parenting. They've walked away from almost everything because they, their values are confused, right? When goals are more important than people in your life, you're being prideful. You're being selfish. You're being stubborn. You're being a whole lot of other things that we can't say in church and I can't say on a recording because the comments would go through the roof and it would, just wouldn't be good. It wouldn't represent Jesus well. And just know that I've been, I've been all those things. Everything that I'm saying, I don't want people to write. I had confused values. I valued work at one point in my life so much more than everything else. Here's what Solomon says about this. This is Ecclesiastes 4, 7, 9. He says, here's another thing on earth that I've seen that makes no sense. Some people don't have any kids, family, or friends, yet they work obsessively, never taking a break. There's no end to their busyness, and they're never content with what they've done or earned. Solomon being the wisest man, he wrote this hundreds of years ago, and I just would say, ain't much changed. Ain't much changed. People with confused values never ask why. Why am I working so hard? Why am I doing all of this? Why am I not happy? Why can't I enjoy this? They never ask themselves that. They never ask, who cares that I'm doing all this? Because they ran everybody in their life off, first of all. Who will all of this go to? What legacy am I leaving? They don't ask any of that. What a senseless and miserable way to live. Oh my goodness. You see how that, hurt? That, that, that comes out of me. I did that, right? God didn't put you on earth to check boxes and to file to-do list. He put you here to learn how to love. First thing he showed me is what we're talking about next week, Matthew 22, 37, 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. How do you get out of learning how to love? Stay busy. Stay busy. Have, wrong, have the wrong values. Have confused values. Why? Because you don't value you. You don't value you. You don't love you. Why won't you rest? You don't value yourself. You matter. Your life matters. Value you like God values you. See yourself how God sees you, and you'll begin to see others the same way and love others the same way. But you've got to love you first. Value you like God values you. Number five reason people won't rest. Last one. Insecurity. I'm afraid I won't have enough. That's what insecurity is. I'm afraid I won't have enough. Here's the thing. You can't have security in anything that can be taken from you, period. You can have a lot of things, including money and property and square footage, etc. 72 cars, doesn't matter. All of that can be taken from you like that. Insecure equals never enough. Fearful, right? No matter what the bar is, when it's reached in your mind, it's not enough. So you're going to keep working like the little engine that could, chasing and reaching for an imaginary bar that always moves. Psalms 127 verse 2 says, It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing and worrying that you won't have enough. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Fearing and worrying equals insecurity. So to recap, five reasons we don't rest. Misplaced identity, materialism, envy, confused values, and insecurity. If you're going to find your flow, you're going to have to find rest. Here's, uh, I'm going to give you some action steps. I'm going to close with this. If you've ever seen uh, the series 1883, this is a story about a group of people who are going from, going from uh, St. Louis to Oregon. And these people, back at that time, this is, this is a wagon train with hundreds of people who decided to make that trek from St. Louis to Oregon. And they began traveling six days a week and resting on the 7th. But as fall approached and winter came, fear of snow and freezing bitter cold temperatures came. And many of them began to complain and, and worry and say, we're not going to make it before winter. We're not going to make it before winter. So naturally, like most people, they said, hey, we need to strike that seventh day. We just need to roll. We need to keep driving, right? We need to keep riding seven days a week until we get there. 
This caused a huge argument among the entire group until finally they couldn't be solved, so they decided to split into two groups, right? One that would travel seven days a week and one that would travel six and rest a day. Guess which group arrived to Oregon first? Yeah, the ones who stopped to rest, the ones who honored the Sabbath, the day off. Both the people and the horses were so rested by stopping for a day that they could travel much more effectively in six days than they could seven. Here's the other thing. When they actually got all the way across the country to Oregon, they were rested, refreshed, and ready to keep going. And the group who traveled seven days barely made it. Barely made it. That's how we live our lives. God wants the same for you. The same thing that he, that he did in, this, in the people who traveled six and rested seven, it's what he wants for you. He knows the rhythm that you need, and he's the one who multiplies the fruit from your effort. He multiplies the fruit from your effort. So when you can trust him enough to stop, you're going to, you're going to begin to experience renewal in all three parts of who you are, and you'll find your rhythm. You'll find your flow. That's how you find it. You must stop to rest first. By the way, rest is not meant to be an addition. It's not to be, meant to be a one more thing that you need to add to your already busy schedule. It's meant to be a reset that gives relaxation and brings refreshment, like Psalms 23 says. When rest is enjoyed instead of endured as a have to, when it's endured and enjoyed as a want to instead of endured as a have to, you find a spiritual rhythm for your life that brings you closer to God. Here's the final scripture for you, Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. So there's full, complete rest still waiting for the people of God. Christ has already entered there. He is resting from his work just as God did after creation. Let us do our best to go to that place of rest too. The Sabbath was created for you by God so that you could imitate him by stopping your work and resting to enjoy the fruit of your labor. So the permission to stop and rest is a gift from God that you're invited to receive. Because without rest for your body or your soul, it's very easy to find yourselves unsure of the larger picture of what God has for your life. God worked, we work. God rested, we rest. To fail to see the value in resting and simply being with God and doing nothing means you're failing to see the heart of Christianity and why Jesus came. Why? Stopping to rest? Because it's time to stop and rest. Because God made it for you. He asked you to do it, and He gave it to you. That's confirming that God is the center of your life. When you can stop and rest and trust Him, that confirms God's the center of your life. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And you trust Him to provide and care for you in every season, including your day off. Here's your action step. Take a snow day. Take a snow day. How many of you guys love a good snow day? Everybody does. Everybody loves a good snow day. First of all, it's way better than a sick day. What happens when a snow day happens? You have no idea it's going to happen. But when it happens, woo! Man, free from, free from every responsibility, right? Take a day, take a day this week and treat it like a snow day. Treat it with the energy and the relief that a snow day gives you. If not, that sick day is going to find you because you're running yourself into the ground. Your next step would be to take a snow day every week. You know, snow days give you the freedom to do whatever you want. There's no obligation. There's no pressure. There's no responsibility. Matter of fact, you just have permission to play. Do you remember that? It's, oh, play day? No, what? What? You just have permission to play. So what's that mean? Read a book. Put on point break and take a nap. Be with your family. Be with your friends. Rarely, rarely does anybody give themselves a no obligation day. Free time is meant to be walked in freedom. Take a snow day. Three, trust God's no obligation day. Trust it. He gives you one every seventh day. Recognize all he's given you in that seventh day and trust him for more. Which means trust the one who's created you. He gives you over seven weeks of snow days every year. 52 total days a year that he gives you. He gives you permission to be off. He's asked you, required, commanded that you be off. Why? So you can find the rhythm of your life. Find your flow. Fourth point, find your flow. Begin to implement, implement intentional stops, rest, reflection, and recognition. You're going to find life. You're going to find energy and expectation the other six days that's not there now if you implement intentional stops and rest. You will be efficient and you will be way more effective, driven less by caffeine and more by your purpose, by rest and the rhythm that God created for you to run if you will 
Take a snow day. Take a Sabbath. Father, I love you. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Lord, to share today on how we find our flow, Lord. I believe with all my heart you've called us to this. You've commanded us to do it. You require it of us. You want it so badly for us. Lord, help us to want it for ourselves like you want it for us because you know the benefits and the life that come from it. Thank you, Lord, for renewing minds, hearts, hands, and feet this week as people go. Help them, Lord, to jump into the rhythm that you've set for them so that they can enjoy life, enjoy what they have, enjoy where they're going, enjoy more. You're a God of life and a God of abundance. We give you glory for that. Thank you for the fruit that's going to come today because we gathered together in the name of Jesus. We love you. We thank you for an amazing day. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time. This was a, this was a thick one. Next week, we're going to talk about helping your heart. Helping your heart. Don't miss that now. I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray the perception of your mind will be enlightened so that you would know what is the hope, His calling, and His purpose for you and the great things that He has in store for you. Super glad you were here. If you need anything ever, please let me know by email, dusty at dustyotis.com. I'll see you next week.